Hello everyone, I'm Stone Labrandi, a lead designer at Riot Games. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person, but I hope you will all enjoy this video presentation. Today I'm going to be talking about a technique I frequently use in the early stages of video game design, paper prototyping. I've been working in the game industry for 20 years. I was a designer on Diablo 3 at Blizzard North, and at EA I worked on many games, including Spore and SimCity. But long before my video game career started, I was still making games. When I was a kid, I saw the movie Star Wars and loved it. My favorite part was the Death Star attack sequence at the end of the film. This was before there were DVD or video recordings, so I couldn't watch the movie whenever I wanted. In order to relive the excitement, I had to make a game simulation of that scene, using little spaceships constructed from paper and toothpicks. One player was the Empire, and the other player was the Rebels. The Empire tries to reach the secret Rebel base and blow it up with its super laser. Meanwhile, the Rebels control a squadron of X-Wings and Y-Wings, and they race against time to destroy the Death Star. While I was growing up, there was a type of movie that was very popular. These were called disaster movies, and, as the name suggests, they were all about different types of disasters skyscrapers catching on fire, airplanes blowing up, giant apes destroying a city, cruise ships turning upside down in the middle of the ocean. I was too young to see most of these films, but that didn't stop me from making games about them. I made this one, cleverly titled The Movie Disaster Game, using colored markers and a file folder. It's a very simple race game. You start at the bottom left and move along a track all the while trying to avoid dying from fires, earthquakes, or sharks. Notice that when you reach the finish line on the right, you're still going to get crushed by King Kong, so you can't really win this one. Rollerball was a science fiction movie that was popular when I was a kid. It's about a futuristic sport where players race around a circular arena using motorcycles and roller skates. In Rollerball, the goal of the game is to capture a small metal cannonball and put it into a goal. Other than that, there aren't many rules, so, as you can see in the image, the players often get seriously injured or killed during a match. I was only 11 years old at the time this movie was released, and there was no way that my parents would let me see it. Still, I was fascinated by this fictional sport. So, even though I hadn't watched the movie, I learned as much as I could about it by watching the television ads and reading newspaper reviews. In order for me to experience the game of rollerball, I couldn't watch it in a movie theater, so instead I had to invent my own paper version of it so that I could experience it on a table with my friends. There was a 7-Eleven store not too far from my house, and I used to stop there on my way home from school to watch the older students play pinball. As a young kid, I didn't have much spare money back then, so all I could do was watch. But when I got home, I would work on my own custom pinball tables using graph paper, markers, and my imagination. I would pretend my finger was the ball and trace out paths through the table. This one was called Black Hole, and the idea was that that big black circle near the bottom, that would be a large spinning magnetic disk that would alter the path of the ball whenever it was nearby. It's so easy to create things when you're a kid and just have a piece of paper in your imagination. In high school English literature class, I was supposed to write an essay about Shakespeare's play, Richard III. Instead, I made a board game version of it, where the players would take the role of the main characters and move around the castle, plotting to overthrow the king. I can't remember what my grade was, but I'm guessing it was either an A+, because of my great creativity, or an F, since I actually didn't do the assignment and didn't end up writing an essay. After college, I got married and had two sons, and of course, I had to make board games for them. These started out as simple educational games that taught color matching, the alphabet, or they exercised the physical dexterity. But the games became more elaborate each year as the kids grew up. There were games about searching a dungeon for treasures, collecting magical swords, building a team of soccer-playing robots, fighting the mighty Kongzilla with laser pointers and mirrors, or abstract pathing games that we would play on our refrigerator during dinners. 
Here are two of the games I made for my children that are based on video games. The one on the left is a simulation of a 4X space game called Masters of Orion. The players have to explore the galaxy, expand their territory, exploit the planets for resources, and ultimately exterminate their enemies. On the right is a board game that combined two of Valve's PC games, Portal and Left 4 Dead. Players are scientists at Aperture Labs, and they race against each other to program deadly robots that can destroy all the zombies that have taken over the Earth. One of my favorite PC games was Diablo 2. I was playing it all the time, and I wanted my sons to play it with me. They were only 10 and 7 years old at the time, so of course my wife didn't think that would be a very good idea. And yes, she was correct. 10 and 7 years old really shouldn't be the right age for playing video games filled with blood, fire, and demons. But I knew how to get around this problem. I would just make my own card game about Diablo, then my kids could play that version with me. Very similar in the way that I used to make games about movies that I couldn't watch. Now I can make a game about a game that my kids can't play. It started out as a simple pencil sketch prototype on index cards. Over time, the cards became nicer and the game became more refined as we played. We continually added in new monsters, character skills, and treasures. Just like in Diablo, you're a hero that collects gold by fighting monsters. Then you use that money to buy better weapons and armor. This lets you fight tougher monsters, which gives you even more gold. This loop continues until you gain enough power to kill the final boss. We ended up with five character classes and hundreds of unique monsters, weapons, and armor pieces. The game got so complicated that I needed to track all the stats in a spreadsheet to keep everything balanced. I called the final game Monster Hunter. This was in 2002, two years before Capcom's Monster Hunter video game came out. The interesting thing about this project was that, at that time, I wasn't a game developer. I was a programmer making software tools at an internet startup company. One day, I happened to meet someone who worked at Blizzard, and I told them about my Diablo-inspired card game. They asked me to bring it over to their studio so that we could play it together during a lunch break. I showed up about a week later, and a group of Diablo developers played the game with me. They liked it so much that after we finished playing, they asked me, Hey, do you want to work at Blizzard? Of course, I said yes. So this card game version of Diablo that I worked on as a hobby helped me get my first job in the game industry where I ended up working on the video game Diablo 3. A little confusing, I know, but it's nice that paper prototypes can help you get jobs in the game industry. Even to this day, I continue creating and experimenting with paper games. I designed the Goblin Kaboomist card for Magic the Gathering. I worked on the board game Mechs vs. Minions at Riot. And I published a game for kids called Alakazam, the Game of Dueling Wizards. It's a travel game designed for kids to keep them entertained on long car trips. In addition to my video game design job, I also teach game design classes at Carnegie Mellon University. As part of the course, the students have to create a unique board game for their final project. I've been teaching this class for 20 years and have played and graded over 200 diverse paper games at this point in time. As you can see, I'm somewhat obsessed with games and game design, and I have been all my life. I wanted to share this brief history with you to give you an idea about how my brain works. For me, just about anything can be represented as an interactive paper experience. So it probably won't surprise you to hear that when I need to solve a video game design problem for a game that I'm working on, I tend to start out with a paper prototype. Imagine you're asked to design a video game. It's early in the process, so of course, there's no controllers yet. Also, there's no sound or music. That'll all come later. And there's not even any art yet. So where do you begin? First, let me be clear about what you should not be doing. Don't think that you have to do something like this. You aren't trying to make a complete board game experience. 
You don't need to duplicate every unit, every map, and every action in your game from beginning to end. Instead, you need to concentrate on the smallest portions of your game. So how do you do that? My first step before starting to work on any prototype is to state my intention. What exactly am I trying to understand? What problem am I trying to solve? If you can't write it down as a simple question, then I don't think you should even start working on the prototype. You need to know what you're aiming for. The goal isn't to answer every question you might have. You only need one clear question. You're trying to focus so that you don't get overwhelmed. You want your prototype to be as quick and simple as possible. The second step is to determine the scope. How much of the game do you need to think about? Maybe you're only concerned with one small section of the game. In this example, you might be trying to understand how a potion store restocks its inventory every day. You want the player to see a variety and types of rarities of potions, and you want the items to become more interesting over time. So you make a deck of potion cards, shuffle them up, and deal them out in sets. You talk with your colleagues about what's good and what's bad about the set. Maybe you determine that pure randomness will cause too many problems. So you divide the deck up into different predetermined categories based on different criteria that will guarantee that the store has a balanced mix of potions each day. Or maybe your scope is larger. You want to understand what actions a player might take during an hour-long session. Here's a simple prototype for a farming game that explores how resources might move around a town during a harvest season. You might make up a few simple rules about how far resources can travel or how supply and demand will affect the player's decisions. As I already mentioned, I don't recommend trying to paper prototype an entire game experience from beginning to end, but it can be done as long as you concentrate on a single feature or system. For instance, maybe you want to explore how a player might choose skills for a warrior as it levels up from level 1 to level 50. You don't need to make a lot of rules and restrictions. Instead, sit down with some teammates and talk about the different paths that you could take, and then mark those with tokens. Compare different strategies for allocating your skill points over time, and try to determine if the chosen skills provide enough depth and variety. Are there interesting decisions to make? Or are there only a few optimal paths? Finally, you may have questions about the metagame. How will players change their behaviors over long periods of time? As a simple example, how might a player change their deck in a trading card game as new sets are released? I'll show you a more detailed example of this later in the presentation. The third major point to consider is the purpose of the prototype. What features or systems in the game need to be explored? The obvious one, but the one you need to be very careful about, is to prototype a mechanical simulation. This means you're trying to represent how events will unfold as if they were on the screen, in a way that is similar to how your player will experience the game. In most cases, it's best to do this type of prototyping code, since computers are much better at this than humans. In this example, one of my students was trying to make a paper simulation of the 80s arcade game Asteroids. He was using Newtonian physics calculations to track masses, velocities, and collisions. This took a long time, was frustrating to do, and it didn't really provide any new information about the game. Mechanical simulations can work, but since the main benefit of paper prototypes is speed, it's best to avoid doing things manually that a computer could do thousands or millions of times faster. My rule of thumb is that if you need a calculator to make your paper prototype work, then you're probably doing it wrong. A much better approach is to use paper prototypes to understand abstract systems. This technique is usually used to look at the game in ways that the player would never see it on screen. It's a particularly good way of understanding relationships between the pieces and systems in your game. For instance, these cards might represent monsters, weapons, and armor that the player may have access to at a certain point in the game. By shuffling them up and dealing out random sets, you can make stories about what the player might be experiencing at that moment. Are they over or underpowered? Do they have the tools they need to complete their desired tasks? Emotional engagement is one of my favorite things to explore with paper prototypes. It's amazing how much emotion you can generate with some random cards and a pair of dice. 
In this example, you draw skateboard tricks from a deck one by one. After looking at the trick, you roll a pair of dice to determine if you succeed or fail. If you succeeded, you have a choice to make. You can either play it safe and stop, take all your points, or you can take a risk and continue by drawing another card. Each extra trick multiplies your score. So if you do three successful tricks in a row, you get a three times bonus. However, if you fail your dice roll, you lose all of your points you have, you have accumulated this round. When I first saw this game played in one of my classes, it was wonderful to hear the laughter, cheers, and groans created from such a simple prototype. The last thing to consider is the time scale. How fast or slow is your paper prototype compared to the final game? Usually, it's going to take longer to play out your paper prototype than your intended final speed. In this way, you're slowing down time. For instance, if I'm trying to understand the actions that I can take in a shooting game and the relative value of each one, I might use a deck of action cards. Something that might take only a second in a video game could take a minute or more in the physical space. One thing I like about the slowed down time scale is that it allows you to explore optimal decisions in a game that might normally cause players to make suboptimal decisions because of time pressure. In this way, it's kind of like getting a peek inside the head of a pro player who's able to make rapid, high-quality decisions. It's kind of like that scene from The Matrix where they go into bullet time and they can make perfect moves because they can just see everything in slow motion. Less common is a prototype that tries to match the same speed as the target video game. You might want to create things like this if you're trying to test reflexes or see how players would react to events if they're forced to take quick actions. Generally, I tend not to do prototypes like this, since it's easier to test these kind of things on your target platform. One of the great benefits of paper prototypes is their ability to show events in fast motion. Something that might take a player several hours to accomplish could be explored in minutes. In this example of a strategy war game, I want to understand how players might move troops around a continent over time. In the final game, it might take several minutes of fighting before the troops advance or retreat. But here, the battle is won or lost based on a single die roll. Since our focus is on strategic troop movement and not on small-scale tactical decisions, we don't need to bother with the details. This lets us fast forward through the game to see long-term play patterns. In summary, here are the four main things to think about before you even begin building a paper prototype. What is your intention? How much of the game am I exploring? What am I trying to understand better? And will I be speeding up or slowing down time? Most of the examples I've shown so far were simple, just to make my points clear. So now, let me spend the last portion of this talk showing some actual examples of paper prototypes that I've done throughout my career. This first one is from a project I was working on while at Blizzard North. This was back when World of Warcraft was still in development, and a small group of us were asked to design a collectible card game that could be played inside of WoW. The idea was that in addition to the standard drops that you would get from killing monsters, things like potions, money, and weapons, you could occasionally get a collectible card drop. If you collected enough cards, you could put them together into a deck and challenge other players when you were inside of a tavern. Because you're already playing a hero in WoW, we wanted the card game to have a different theme. We decided that it would be about controlling large armies, and we used Warcraft 3, which is a real-time strategy game, as our model. We printed out cards and playtested during our lunch break for over a month. We were constantly tuning and refining the game. It never shipped, but we were really happy with the final gameplay. We called the game War Cards, and our intention was pretty clear. What would be a card game to play inside of WoW? The original scope was meant to span only one session of the game, but since we worked on it for so long, we were also experiencing some of the metagame progression as we introduced new factions and balanced the cards over time. This would be similar to how the players would play the game inside of WoW, since they would be gradually adding cards to their deck as they got new ones from fighting monsters. War Cards is a good example of what most designers think about when they are asked to make a paper prototype. 
they try to create a complete game experience that closely matches the final player experience. Obviously, it works in this case, because we're using paper cards to prototype a digital card game, so it's almost one for one. The one big difference is the time scale. What might take us 15 to 20 minutes to play on a table probably would have taken maybe only 5 to 10 minutes if a computer was doing all the shuffling, tracking the stats and special abilities, and doing the combat math. I wanted to share with you one interesting story that happened during our play tests. Since our prototype was based on the game Warcraft 3, we had access to all the stats that were used to tune the PC game. There were a lot more calculations going on in the PC game, obviously, than in the card game, so we had to create a simple formula that converted each unit's PC game stats into two primary card game attributes, attack power and life. This headhunter that you see here has an attack power of 3 and a life of 1. As we were testing, I noticed that nobody was putting this unit into their decks. It was perceived to be too weak compared to all the other options. So I went back and I looked at the spreadsheet to make sure that the conversion from the PC to our game was correct, and everything seemed to check out. Nevertheless, I decided to bump up his life from 1 to 2. That did the trick, and players started using him in their decks again. About a week later, completely independent from our small group, there was a patch for the PC version of Warcraft 3 where they decided to increase the life of the Headhunter. This was based on the analysis of millions of games over several weeks of playtime on Battle.net. I've always been amazed that our team of eight, playing a few games each day during our lunch breaks, was able to notice the same weakness in the Headhunter. Around the same time that we were working on War Cards, the Blizzard North Studio was exploring ideas for other games that wouldn't be set in the world of Diablo. One of those ideas was a game that combined the science fiction world of StarCraft with the action RPG gameplay of Diablo. Instead of killing monsters with swords and magic, you would be a space marine, killing aliens with guns and flamethrowers. One of my early design tasks on this project was to prototype several sets of weapons that would appear in the game. I originally started doing it in a spreadsheet, but wanted to get the team more excited about the project. So I printed out playing cards with all the weapons on them, and then I gave them out to the teammates to look through and ask for their feedback. Initially, none of the cards had illustrations, and they all looked just like the boxes that you see on the viral lance and the tentacle gun. I knew that they would be more interesting with illustrations, so I told the artist that if they would draw me a picture of the weapon, I would print it out on the card along with their name. This worked really well, and it inspired the artists to compete with each other to make the coolest looking weapons. As the art got nicer, the team members became more and more interested and started asking me if I could print out their own sets of cards. This gave the weapon system a lot more visibility. Ask yourself, if you're having a discussion about weapons, would you rather have an entire collection on the table in front of you, or would you rather just look at the weapons represented as stats in rows and columns of a spreadsheet? I think the answer is pretty obvious. The intention was to understand the weapons that would be available and how they relate to each other. The scope of the paper prototype was focused on a single idea. I was only concerned with the weapons, not the combat math, or character classes, or any other aspects of the game. As you can see, this was a very abstract prototype, and it wasn't really meant to illustrate gameplay at all. Originally, there was no sense of time. However, after we had produced many weapon cards, we began sorting them into different categories so that we could get a feel for how the player would unlock the weapons over time. So for instance, we decided to start with the more familiar weapons, like shotguns and pistols, and then we would slowly add in more unique and strange alien weapons as the player progressed through the game. After I left Blizzard, I started working at EA. The first game that I worked on there was The Simpsons Game. My job was to design the city of Springfield, where the Simpson family lives. We had access to a lot of the background art, but this art would only show small sections of the town, and didn't help us understand how the entire city was laid out. During that period of early development, I watched hundreds of episodes of The Simpsons cartoon, but unfortunately, 
This was the best reference map that I could find from the show. Obviously, this wasn't very helpful. However, I did learn that there was a river running through the middle of the town, so at least that gave me a rough starting point. I cut up a bunch of old cardboard boxes and put down yellow sticky notes showing the approximate location of the iconic buildings. This included the Simpsons house, the nuclear power plant where Homer works, Barton Lisa's school, and about 10 other key landmarks. And most importantly, I made sure that there was a river running through the middle of the town. This paper prototype was done long before we had our 3D engine working. It only took about an hour to build, but the team was able to stand around the table and talk about the relative distances between places and how the player would unlock the city content as the game progressed. Over time, the map became more refined. I eventually added in cutouts of the buildings to get a sense of how the heights of these important landmarks would affect the landscape. At this point, I was trying to keep everything to scale and I wanted the tall buildings to act as guideposts to help the player navigate when they got lost. This map turned out to be a valuable reference tool for the team. Even though it was meant to be quick and temporary, we ended up using it throughout the first year of development. It was much more convenient for the team to gather around the table and push pieces of paper around than it was to load up the 3D model of the city and display it on a monitor. As I mentioned, the original intention of this paper prototype was simple. Figure out where all the main buildings would be located. The scope covered the entire game because the city doesn't change as the game progresses. It's basically the same city at the beginning of the game as it is at the end. It was a mechanical simulation, not because we were trying to match actual gameplay, but we did want to precisely match the scale of the in-game city. This allowed us to understand travel times based on distances and the speed of walking, running, or driving. Even the width of the sidewalks were to scale so that we could make sure that there was enough room for the NPCs to path correctly as they walked around the town. And the time scale was very fast. Since we could use the prototype to talk about any phase of the game from beginning to the end. After the Simpsons game project, I transferred over to the Maxis group and worked as a designer on Spore. My first task there was to design the introductory stage of Spore that we called the Cell Game. To begin, I quickly made a simple game where you could build your own cell and move it around a hex grid as you tried to eat food and flee from predators. As you can see, this art was quite rough. I was a little bit embarrassed to show this to my colleagues, so I kept it to myself at home and worked on it at nights. After some iteration, I started cleaning up the art and refining the pieces and their effects. At that point, I felt more comfortable showing it to the team. While playing the game, we would brainstorm different abilities for the pieces and try to determine how interesting they might be. This process didn't take long, maybe only a day or two. Eventually, we came up with a final list that we decided to implement. The intention of this paper prototype was to determine the different functions for the cell parts. The scope covered the entire session from when your cell first starts the game to how it evolves over time. It was a mechanical simulation that tried to match the experience that a player would have as their cell interacted with other cells and competed for food. And the time scale was much slower than the actual game would be, since we were playing it out step by step as we pushed the cells around on a hex grid. After completing my work on the cell game, I decided that the prototype was a lot of fun, and I wanted to convert it over to a standalone board game. This was just for my own amusement, and it wasn't related to any work project. I called the game Nanobots, and instead of taking place at the dawn of life on our planet, I set it in the future, where all the cells are bioengineered microscopic robots. About a year later, our studio determined that we had about $1 million that was budgeted for an Xbox or PlayStation arcade game, and we had to spend it by the end of the year. So don't ask me how the accounting is done at EA, but still, I was happy to spend that money. They asked the team to submit different game ideas, and I decided to pitch Nanobots. Rather than write up a formal design proposal, I just brought in my board game and showed it to our lead producer. He selected it from all the submissions, and we ended up translating it into the digital game called Microbots. 
This game is similar to Spore's Cell game, but with lasers and missile launchers, and it's much more action-oriented. The scope, purpose, and time scale are the same as the Cell prototype. But unlike the other prototypes I've shown, this example really didn't have a motivating intention. It was more of a happy accident. Still, it's nice to know that you can use a paper prototype as a way to make a pitch for a digital game. In Spore, you start out as a small cell creature, but over the course of the game, you move on to land and team up with other creatures to form tribes. Soon you are learning advanced technologies and can build vehicles and large cities. We call this the Civ, short for Civilization, stage of the game. At this point, you can either cooperate peacefully with your neighbors, or you can attack them and try to take over the entire planet for yourself. While I was working on the cell game design, the product manager on the Civ game approached me. He had seen my cell game paper prototype and was wondering if I could make a similar prototype for the Civ game to help them understand their combat system. I wasn't sure about the details, but I knew the components and the basic flow of the game, so I went home that night and made a bunch of unit counters and basic maps. I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing with them yet, but I figured the product manager would help me convert these pieces into a playable prototype. The next day at lunch, a small group of the Civ developers gathered together in a meeting room to play the prototype. I put all the pieces on the table and asked them, how should we start? To my surprise, nobody could answer that question. Instead, each person had a different idea of how the game would even begin. This caused a spirited debate. Not being a part of the team, all I could do was just sit back and listen to their discussion. By the time the meeting ended, we still hadn't even started playing the prototype. At first, I felt sad that I had spent all that time working on this game for nothing. So, my intention which was to balance the units and actions, wasn't achieved. However, after thinking about it some more, I still think that this paper prototype was quite successful. It had forced all the team members to get together and have a discussion. This made them aware that they weren't aligned with each other. And I'm sure that they would have realized this at some point in the future, but the prototype forced them to see it sooner and made the specifics very clear. The scope, which was meant to be a single session, turned into a conversation about the game as a whole. And what should have been a fast mechanical simulation became an abstract discussion about the core concepts of the game. So sometimes you may not achieve your stated goals, but you can still learn a lot if you're flexible and keep an open mind. After Spore, I began designing the expansion pack called Galactic Adventures. This was a powerful editor that let players make their own video games using the planets, buildings, vehicles, and creatures that they created in Spore. Like the other examples I've shown today, this one started out very rough on paper. We knew the player experience would be centered on the game editor, so we spent a lot of time experimenting with different UI mockups. We asked different team members to come in and pretend to make a game scenario using our fake UI. As they did, they would talk out loud, telling us what their goals were and what they were trying to accomplish. For instance, they might say, I want to make a character named Joe who's trying to find a key. Then we would quickly cut out a piece of paper and write Joe on it. And then we cut out another with the word key on it and hand them to the player. Then they might say, when Joe sees Amy, I want him to be able to ask Amy one of three questions. Then we would cut out a dialogue box and put it in front of the player. Eventually, after several iterations, we had enough pieces and examples that we felt comfortable writing up the design document for the engineers to implement. I should note that the engineers were involved with the paper prototype process, so they already had a good sense of the work that they would be doing before it was formally documented. Our intention was to validate if players had all the tools and features needed to build their own custom games. The scope covered one session of play. The purpose actually started out as a mechanical simulation, since we were attempting to mirror what the player would see on the screen. But as we iterated, we realized that the players were becoming very emotionally engaged. This makes sense, because we were asking them to make personal stories that appealed to them, 
but it still surprised us at the time. It also gave us a good feeling that if players could get emotionally engaged with the paper prototype, then that would carry over into the final product. We expected the timescale to be slow at first because we were busy drawing pieces and cutting them out as the player needed them. But after a few iterations, we had created enough pieces that it wasn't much of an issue. And we discovered that most of the player's time wasn't spent clicking on things and selecting menu commands. It was spent thinking and reflecting about the story they wanted to tell. That was all happening in the player's head, not on paper. OK, this is my final example. When I first started at Riot, about six years ago, I was given the opportunity to pitch several different game ideas. One of those was a proposal for a turn-based fighting game using the champions from League of Legends. Before I talk more about this prototype, I want to emphasize two important things. First is that this is only a proposal, and this game is not currently in development at Riot. Second is that you may have heard that Riot recently announced that they were working on a fighting game. The prototype I'll be showing here is completely unrelated to that game. The game I'll be talking about was designed to be a turn-based strategy game, not an action arcade game. In the beginning of the process, I was a team of one. I was working alone and had no access to artists or engineers, but I did have some access to a laser cutter. So, based on my experiences with the Microbot proposal, I decided to pitch the game using a fully playable prototype instead of a design document. In this game, players simultaneously play a card from their hand and then move their champion up or down the lane, trying to push their minions towards the opponent's turret. Whoever destroys the enemy's turret first is the winner. Although I used cards in this prototype, it wasn't actually a card game. There's no deck building, shuffling, or discard piles. Instead, the cards just represent actions that you're allowed to take each turn. As I mentioned, the intention was to pitch an idea for a new game to the executives. Normally, when I'm making paper prototypes, I try to do everything very quickly. But since I had some extra time, and I was trying to impress the executives, I invested a lot more effort into this game. In fact, technically, it's not really even a paper prototype, since it's made out of acrylics. The scope covered the full game, from the beginning to the end of a battle. It was a mechanical simulation that was meant to be very close to the final player experience. And I knew that the time scale would be slow, but I was surprised to find out how slow it really was. Our prototype battles would take about 30 minutes to play out. I assume that when we had a computer version, it might take about 15 minutes per game, since the computer could update all of the stats and keep track of the player's actions. Eventually, we got everything running in Unity and discovered that our games were only taking about three minutes to play once the players understood the basic actions. In fact, even though the game was a turn-based strategy game, we ended up adding in joystick support so that players could take their actions even faster. What I had assumed on paper would be a slow-paced, thoughtful game had become a twitchy action game when it was in its digital format. To wrap it up, let me summarize a few important points. I've said this multiple times, but it's worth repeating. Make sure that you understand what you're trying to accomplish before you start. Write down your goals before beginning any work. Trust me, it's very easy to get distracted and go off in a different direction. Keep looking at your target goal and always head towards it, and then stop when you reach it. If you want to continue advancing your prototype, write down the next goal before proceeding. Determine the audience that will be playing the prototype. It's typically other designers, but maybe it's engineers, executives, or possibly only you. Each audience will have a completely different set of needs to meet. Decide on your desired quality level. Is it okay to use pencil sketches and index cards, or do you need polished art and components to meet your stated goal? One size doesn't fit all. Every project is different. A paper prototype for an abstract mobile game will be different than one for a AAA console action game. Think about the variety of prototypes that I just showed you. Each one was different and had its own purpose. I guarantee you that your prototypes will be unique too. Keep an open mind and be flexible as you proceed. It doesn't need to be fun. In fact, it doesn't really even need to be a game. 
This is probably the most common mistake you can make. You think, well, if the prototype isn't fun, then the final game won't be fun either. Don't confuse the prototype with the final product. You aren't trying to sell your paper prototype. Its only purpose is to answer questions quickly. It's common for me to start working on a paper prototype and find the answers before I even make the pieces. Just the act of thinking about the problem helps provide clarity. Sometimes I can figure it out in my sketchbook just by drawing little doodles. If that's all it takes, then that's all you need to do. Resist the urge to add extra features that are only intended to make your prototype a better standalone game, especially if those features aren't helping you reach your stated goals. All right, thank you for listening, and I hope this talk helps you make your own paper prototypes in the future. Please feel free to check out my website, stonetronics.com, where I have links to many other lectures, exercises, and games. Thank you. Uh, 那就是，请大家就是现在，呃，可以用 Slido 的 link 在那个呃我们的 Chat 的 Night Bar 上面应该会一直播送那个 Slido link， 然后大家可以到那边提问，那看大家对刚刚讲者的演讲有没有什么呃相关的问题。呃，那在大家准备问问题之前，就是我会先就是提出一些我这边的呃准备好的问题，那让大家有时间可以去呃。整理自己的想法，这样子。好，那我这边会开始就先问我这里的问题。那我我的第一个问题，呃，有点像是因为刚刚在演讲中其实有提到，呃 ，Stone 本人他其实之前是城市设计师。那我想知道的是说他自己有城市训练，跟呃他后来做 Paper Prototype 的时候，在这种就是设计资源型的合理性，或者说在城城市后面可城市的这个可城市化的这种。可行性上面，他自己会不会觉得这个有一些帮助？这样。Okay, Stone. So, uh, my my first question is, since you you mentioned that you have, uh, you have been a programmer before and for other uh companies and and doing software jobs, I was wondering if, uh, those programming trainings and like, uh, trainings in tech or in in logic in general helps. When you are doing paper prototyping, like when you are paper prototyping, you have to maybe consider if that is actually can be uh, if if that feature can actually be implemented. Will will you be worrying about those when you are doing paper prototyping? Um, usually, not too much because the goal isn't to try to get something to the state that you would just easily be able to transfer it over to the computer. It's more of an exploration of ideas, and so you don't want to have artificial constraints that you might not need to have at that phase.、Mm -hmm. 对，那呃 ，Stone， 呃的意思是说，就是他觉得其实应该，他在做纸原型的时候，不太会特别去在意说到底这个东西之后在城市上面是不是真的可以执行，因为你在做纸原型的时候，可能。呃，就是你你真的要关心的事情，并不是说它到底在电脑上跑不跑得起来，而是可能只是在测试一些想法。那这个东西，这些想法可能本来就不能在电脑上运作。Yeah, but I did want to add that a lot of, especially when you're doing a board game, there's a sequence of events that happens, like a turn order, and that can be very much like programming, with like you're stepping through a bunch of steps in a row. And calling little functions, they're doing little routines, and so sometimes that can feel a lot like you're writing a program when you're writing game rules. 对，那他说他想要补充的是说，呃，就是，但是如果你是在设计像回合制的桌上游戏的时候，可能那个设计的过程本来就会很像，就是在写程式、写程式时候的逻辑，就是，呃，你可能要一步一步的去想，说我这个。这个规则执行了之后会发生什么事情，然后会再导致下一个步骤要做什么事情，就这些东西本来就可能跟城市的思考上会有一点点像这样。Okay. Okay. So I think we have our、uh, audience question now. I'll try to read them、uh, first and then、uh, repeat that in, in English to you. Yeah, the 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 font is a bit small. 字有点小。OK， 可以，现现在可以了，现在可以了。好
。那第一个问题是在需要在制作，在需要制作 prototype 用来提案或验证文法可行性的时候，你觉得设计纸原型会比直接写程式做实做出玩法更有效果吗？那你会如何取舍？ Okay, so the first question is it's kind of like the extension of uh, uh, the question that I just just asked. It's like when you are doing a paper prototype to make a proposal or doing a pitch, and or like trying to prove something that is actually playable. Um, do you think paper prototyping would be more useful than, say, you pro you just implement it uh, on the computer? And how do you like pick and choose different uh, techniques since you basically have both? Yeah, so a lot of it will depend on the problem that I'm trying to solve. So as I mentioned in the talk, there's some problems, say things with lots of physics that I wouldn't want to try to do on paper. Uh, so yes. I'm going to translate that. Yeah. 就是他在演讲中的一个片段，其实有大概提到说，就是有些事情，呃，他已经说，就是要决定哪一个做法，是他会先看问题的本质到底是什么。那像刚刚在演讲中有提到说，有一段是，如果你要去测试物理的逻辑或是物理的一些游戏机制的话，那这个你可能就不太会想要用纸原型的方式来制作。Yeah, but sometimes the idea, like from the examples in the talk. You can do them very quickly. You just grab some dice, or you just draw something on a piece of paper, and the speed that you can do that, which is maybe measured in minutes, compared to trying to write a program, which is even you know even fast programming might take hours uh, and debugging and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so the fact that it's there on the table that everybody can touch it at the same time. And work on it together instead of one programmer going off and doing all the work and then coming back and showing it to people. 对，那还有一个很重要的点是，就是你如果只是把纸笔或者是用一些骰子的方式在桌上跟大家呈现你的玩法或是你的概念的时候，呃，不仅是它速速度非常的快，你可能写个程式要测试一下怎么玩东西，可能都要好几个小时。那呃，很快的把东西陈陈列在桌上开始讨论，这可能需要只需要几分钟的时间。而且还有一个很关键的是，如果你要用城市实作的话，那那个城市员他可能就必须要呃单独的离开，然后可能自己写个城市，写个两三小时，然后再回来跟大家讨论。那如果是用呃纸原型的方式，或者说用桌上实体物件的方式来跟大家讨论的话，就变成在很短时间内，而且可以很多人同时讨论。OK， so um the next I'll 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 pick another audience question. 这个可以请，呃，在现场的听众可以去点一下那个问题的那个按赞，哦，就是可以把它 upvote， 把它投票投上来一点，要不然的话我就会一直照顺序往下往下念了。上面有上面有已经有有那个一两票的吗？哦，有有三票的，好，好好来来三票的。好，那这个问题是刚刚子模型设计的游戏概念，多数是从无到有。呃，它跳掉了，<笑>往下卷一点。好，那或者说创新玩法，那如果是参考已经存在的游戏概念，或甚至是市场上已经有的范本参考，还有需要制作子模型吗？好 ，OK， so the question is， um， since most of the、uh, examples they talked about is basically making something new and really original， and、uh, So that's when, like, seems that that's that's when like paper prototyping is really helpful in in that regard. But when you are、uh, considering,、um, like, maybe taking some inspirations from the existing game design, or like other games that have just been released recently, and you base some ideas from that, do you think? Uh, when when you are doing that, do do you still do paper prototyping?、Um, no, not in that case. Like、mm -hmm. if we have a good working example,、mm -hmm. then we would just point towards that example.、Uh, there's no reason to try to reduplicate something that we already know the answer to. Okay. 好，那这个答答案还蛮单纯，就是呃，确实只要是在市面上，或是说你已经看过的既有成熟的玩法或者设计的话，其实。
那等于是你对那个设计的答案，你大概已经知道了。那这种时候就不太需要用纸模型来探索。Okay, then yeah, I'll pick. I mean, the, the... Oh, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, I was just trying to to say I'm picking another question. So if you have anything, okay. at, yeah. No, I was just going to say that uh, the paper prototyping, that's when it's the best, is when you don't know and you don't have examples. Um, so using it for the new things is one of the more positive or one of the, the best ways to use it. Mm -hmm. 对，那所以刚刚讲者再重复强调，就是呃，纸模型的的这个最佳的使用时机，就是确实在你不知道答案的时候，你想要探索的时候，这个是最好最好的使用时机。Okay, I'm uh, going on to the next question. 好，那如果制作 prototype 的时候花了很多时间测试，那会有什么是一个适合的时间停损点嘛？就是如果测试了很久，那结果还是不知道到底好不好玩，那是不是应该要直接转换 ？So the next question is, uh, if you are doing when you are doing paper prototyping and then somehow you got stuck during the process and and maybe the the paper prototyping itself took maybe months. Uh, in that case, would you like set a point saying, you know, I, I sh we should just scrap this and then move on? Yeah. Um, so generally, if most of the paper prototypes will only take a day, and if it's going longer than that, then you're probably doing something wrong mm -hmm. because you, as I mentioned in the talk, you want to be very focused on very specific problems. And you'll know with sometimes within minutes or hours that you're you were advancing or you're not advancing. Um, so it's very rare, except maybe in one of those last examples that well, I'm trying to be very polished, that it would take you know more than a couple weeks. Okay. But most of them just just, just take one day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 那江子的回答是，就是其实大多大多数的纸原型理论上应该在。一天之内就可以做出来。那如果你花了非常多时间在做这些东西，可能其实代表你本来一开始的出发点可能就有有一些方向上的错误。那呃，只有在他刚演讲的最后几个例子，那时候他可能会因为特定的其他目的，想要特别打磨那些纸那些 prototype 的时候，他才会花比较多时间，可能会花几周的时间去做那些原型。但是应该不可能到。就是像譬如说这个问题里面提到六个月那么长。Okay, then I'll move on to the next question. So, 能不能 share 一个跟别人一起制作纸原型的过程？大概有哪些阶段？如何分工？如何验收？呃 ，So the next、uh, question is, can you talk about how do you share the process of making a paper, paper prototype with your teammates and?、Uh, What are the stages for those collaboration, and how do you, how do you、uh, teamwork on that, and how do you,、uh, as a team, decide on yeah we have we, we can we can now close this prototype and we can move on or we can implement it.、Uh, yeah, so there's kind of two two parts to this. So the first one would be that it's not really a team exercise; that it's just me exploring ideas. Um, and so, to make it easy for me to visualize or to be interactive with it, I might just put some pieces down on my desk and move them around.、Um, so that's kind of the first answer.、Um, if you want to translate that, then I'll talk about the second part. Okay. 那他说这个这个问题他有两个方向的回答。那第一个是说，其实他在做纸原型或者是类似的这个思考过程的时候，其实他通常是一个人做，然后。就是很快的在桌上把一些东西摆出来，然后就开始做一些想法上的实验。所以其实在这个过程中不太会跟别人呃有互动或是合作。Okay. okay, and then the second, the team activity,、um, is usually you get some people in the room and no one really knows the answers, but you're just trying to find them out by playing.、Um, and if you get stuck, you add a new piece or you change a rule. Uh, so it's very interactive, and everybody participates at the same time. So it's it's not like a presentation from me to everybody else. Like I made a game, and now you play the game. It's we're trying to discover something. So let's all get together and use this as a tool for discovery. Okay. 好，那
呃，第二个部分就是说，当你一个职员型大概有一些基本的构想之后，你可能会找你的队友或是朋友来呃进来测试。那这个时候就会变成是一个非常及时互动的过程。那每一个人都可以出意见，然后如果遇到问题，可能就是大家讨论怎么解决，马上去改一些规则，或是增加一些新的呃要素在这个职员型里面。那这个过程就会变成非常的，就是有团队合作的感觉。但是那也是一个算是很短的 session。Okay. Yeah, and I'm sure that we've all done exercises on whiteboards, where people have markers and you stand by a whiteboard and you draw diagrams and you erase diagrams. It's very much like that, except you're playing a game with pieces instead of just drawing diagrams on a whiteboard. 对，那很好的一个呃类比的想法就是说。你可能以前也有跟在该跟这个同队的人，或者说跟公司的人，在会议室里面，呃，对着白板指指点点，然后把白板东西写一写又擦掉，写一写又擦掉。那其实找很多人一起来测试你的指原型的的那个过程，其实就跟那个白板讨论的过程其实会很像，只是说你现在不是在用白板，你现在是用一些实际实际的物件、骰子，或者是说卡牌来做一些呃想法上的讨论。Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, question. Um, 请问现在有很多的游戏玩法会是三 D 立体自由移动的。那这个在纸上讨论时有什么好的方法来做呈现吗 ？Okay, this is a very interesting. It's also one of the question that I want to ask.、Uh, so a lot of the games nowadays is uh 3D, and you basically can move in three different dimensions. So, when you are paper prototyping the systems or the game play of that type of game,、uh, is there a good way to do that?、Um, the short answer is no.、Um, <laughs> the I I have kind of a rule for myself, which is I try never to make maps. I try never to try to duplicate level design. Okay. Instead, I try to be much more abstract and just answer questions about, say, smaller systems and interactions between those systems.、Mm -hmm. But I never, I never try to make like、oh, I'm moving little pieces through a maze and they're going around corners.、Mm -hmm. And those kind of prototypes, I find that those aren't helpful at all. So, that, uh, this answer, answer is that actually, he when he does the shape of the shape, he will try to make. 焦聚焦在一些抽象的的概念的测试，或者是说，呃，你你你的游戏玩法里面几个不同小部分的互动方式，那他很少会做说就是把呃就是游戏的棋子啊、地图啊、关卡都做出来，然后开始想要去探索说，那到底这个关卡的这个三度空间上的逻辑到底呃合不合理，然后移动棋子来来做这些测试，那他就说。他觉得这这一类的的呃行为是他觉得可能在这方面最没有效率、最没有效益的呃一种做法。Yeah. Okay. The next question. Um. 请问在制作过程中，呃，成员当中出现的意设计分歧，双方都有自己设计的想法，而且都坚持自己的理念，但可能也没有。呃，很难去分别对与错的时候，请问这个时候会要怎么处理 ？Okay, so this this question is probably a, not really about paper prototyping, but、uh, team communication and 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 how to collaboratively design. So the question is, when when you are making a game, when we're designing designing it, and then the team have、uh, a di a diverge in like. The the ideas they want they want they want to put into the game, and both sides, like both ideas or like may, maybe like many ideas are valid on their own, and the people who present them also、uh, can make a very good case for their own idea.、Mm -hmm. So there's like like not a very a distinct right and wrong situation here. Then when you are Like when you self、uh, run into this kind of situation, how do you resolve that between your teammates? Yeah, a lot of it depends on the team hierarchy and the rules that your team already has set up about who's responsible for which parts of the decision-making process.、Mm -hmm. 
So if, um, if your team is really big and it's like a company, say like Riot or EA or Blizzard, then you have a, you know who makes the call. So if there's ever an argument, you just go up the chain until you find the person who, who breaks it. <laughs> um, but, if, but if you're in a smaller, like an indie group, and maybe there's no formal hierarchy, uh, then you know this, so whoever yells the loudest, I don't know, sometimes the programmer always wins because they're going to be the one that does the work anyway. <laughs> um, but there's not, there's not really an easy answer in that case. Yeah, OK, OK, I'll translate it. So, uh, mm-hmm. the answer is that 呃，这个跟你的团队组成还有团队架构有非常直接的关联。就是像在大公司，譬如说江泽工作过的 E A 暴雪，或者是呃呃 Riot 这些大型的公司里面，你遇到这种团队意见分歧的时候，最直接的做法其实基本上就是往上回报。那看最后是谁下决定。那总之会，总之一直往上回报的过程中，会有一个人他他可以，或者他应该要负责下这个决定。那这个时候就不要再争论，就是找他来下决定就对了。但是在小团队里面的时候，就确实，呃，可能在很水平的架构里面，你很难去决定到底是谁要负责做什么。哦，稍微补充一下，刚刚江泽一开始有先提到说，呃，除了像刚刚那样子公司阶层架构之外，另外一个很关键的区分方式是说，在三五个人讨论的时候，到底谁负责哪一部分比较多？譬如说，可能有人专门设计战斗系统，有人专门设计跟音乐音效相关的系统之类的，像这种情况，那跟他们比较相关的呃主题，其实应该就由他们去拿主意这样。那小团队的时候，我想大家可能就比较偏向像这样子的呃运作方式，就是呃三五个人，那大家要各自先把自己的分工定位先定出来，然后当真的有争论的时候。由最接近那个负责领域的人去下决定。那刚刚讲者有点开玩笑的是说，通常在小团队里面，也许最后都是写程式人下决定，因为总之是由要由他来写程式，那他不写就没辙这样。OK， so the next question is， 嗯，不好意思，可以可以再帮我卷一下 slide 吗？有没有更上面或更下面的问题？ OK， 那个答过了，答过了，答过了。OK， maybe this is like the the last question because we are actually kind of out of time here. I'll just ask the the,、oh, okay. the, the last question. 那在最后一个问题是在制作游戏的过程中，剧本剧情是重要的吗？游戏性呃与剧本之间，你会怎么取舍？ Okay, so this question maybe is not particularly about paper uh, paper prototyping as well. It's just like a general design and and、uh, production question is, which is, when you are making a game and and maybe your game is like narrative heavy, so when narrative and gameplay doesn't really work together at some point during your process, how would you pick and choose? And、uh, would you say gameplay is more、uh, important in that part, or maybe the narrative is more important? Yeah.、Um, see if I could try to answer this somewhat quickly.、Yeah. But we have a framework that we use, and、um, at the lowest level is the player fantasy, which is why does the player even want to do this activity、oh. um, in the first place, and that's the most important. So, if you think of your audience and what they're, why they're coming to your game, you want to give them that experience. So it maybe they want to pretend to be a、uh, guitar player, or maybe they want to manage a FIFA team.、Um, so that's the lowest level. So if you want to translate that, then I can step up. Okay. 那就是在在讲这个问题的时候，可能讲者要用几个不同的层次来回答。那最最最主要的一个层次，或者说最最基础、最根本的层次，就是说，你要让玩家，呃，被你的游戏所吸引，然后他要来玩你的游戏。其实，通常你需要卖一个想象给他，就是一个一个玩家的幻想或是一个梦想。那，就是，呃，必须要先决定好这个东西到底是什么。OK。OK， so fantasy always wins. 
Um, and then above that is what we call actions, which are the verbs, the things that the player can actually do、mm-hmm. to fulfill that fantasy. 好，那在下一层就是说，你你让你的玩家对你的游戏、你的作品有想象了之后，在下一层就是一些所谓的动作动词。你在这个想象底下，在这个或者可以说世界观底下，你有什么动作可以做？有什么在你的游戏内可以执行的动词、动作这样子 ？OK， then the next level up is the what we call economy， which is all, how all the systems work together within the game. And so, you know, like fantasy always wins, then action wins, and is next level. Then economy is the level、um, after that. And then there's two more levels to go after that. 好，那在第三个第三个层次是，就是呃，用比较白话的讲法是说是游戏的经济体，或是游戏的整体，可以说整体循环架构吧。就是最重要的，永远就是最优先、最重要的是玩家的，呃，提供给玩家的幻想或构想。然后下一层是玩家可以执行的动作跟行为。那再下一层就是刚刚提到，就是整体的这个经济，整体的呃各种不同的游戏的元件元素凑起来会长什么样，怎么互动。Okay, and then the next one is what we call world, which is this is what the world looks like, the the environment that you're in while you're playing the game. 嗯哼，好，那在第四层是就是。实际上，你在玩这个游戏的时候，到底玩家是在哪一个，就是，呃，就是具体的世界，或者说具体的这个场景底下。And then the final one is what we call story, which is the narrative on top of all of that. 对，然后最后一层，第五层就是才会出现所谓的故事，就是故事是在最后面。Okay, so when you think of them in order like that. Once you've established the player fantasy, changing it changes everything else.、Mm-hmm. Once you've decided on your actions, changing your actions changes everything above that. But you can keep your fantasy and you know work your way up. And that's why like narrative is the easiest to change without changing anything below it.、Um, but fantasy is really difficult to change because it will impact everything above it.、Mm-hmm. So that's why we use that level.、Uh, that's why we use that kind of grading system to see. How much impact the change will have, and narrative tends to be really easy to change without impacting a lot of stuff underneath of it.、Um, that's so. Okay. okay, thank you. 对，那这个综合起来讲，就是说，一开始你你卖给玩家那个最初的那个幻想，那个那个梦想，其实是最重要的东西。如果他改了，刚刚上面讲的总共五个层次，如果你改了最底层的那一个。玩家的像是卖一个梦想那种感觉。那如果你改变了那个东西，改变那个游戏概念，最最核心的概念，你后面的所有的游戏要执行的动作，游戏的这个经济系统，然后再来是游戏的这个实体的世界环境，然后到最后的这个呃剧情叙事，其实那全部都会改。好，那所以最越改越底层，改越底层的东西，越上层的东西都会都会一起跟着动这样。那所以，其实，在这样的情况下，江泽认为剧情或者叙事其实是最容易改的部分。对，那所以就是这个是江泽他们的在讨论这些设计的时候会用的阶层架构。OK， OK， All right， Hopefully that was clear. I know it's a, it's more complicated、um, than you know trying to translate it, but hopefully that comes through. OK， Yeah， 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 yeah I, I hope 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 I did a, did an OK job. OK， So、um, Uh, maybe we just say goodbye to the audience. Okay. <laughs> not... All right. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for、uh, watching the talk, and I hope you all learned from it today. 好，那就是很感谢，就是这是这是可以邀请到 Stone 呃、uh, Librandi 来来我们这个呃、uh, TGDF 做做这个演讲。好、okay. ，Thank you very much. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. 好好好，那呃。就是后续如果还有其他的呃问题的话，我想呃大家都可以呃在，比如说你可以到事后到这个 TGDF 的 Facebook 呃粉丝团可以再来留言、呃、或者是用其他的方式呃，就是可以用其他的方式想办法跟呃主办单位这边联系。那如果你们对于那些讲者的问题还就是呃针针对那些讲者还想再再提一些额外的问题的话，就是可以。呃
随时再跟我们联系。那或者是说，讲者他在影片中也有提到他个人的网站，那上面有很多相关的资源，还有他的联络方式。那就是其实这些东西，你们大家都可以就是尽量去利用。